Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of our conference. Hope you all are doing well. Hope you had a fabulous day yesterday and looking forward to all the stuff, all the stuff that we have today. About 20 seconds. <laughs> Thought we were live there for a second. Oh, <laughs> it's good. It's hard to yeah, tell. Get the, next time is the, the hit. <laughs> <laughs> good. That was good. All right. Um, but we that. are live. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, it's Joy. Uh, and I am here with the amazing, fabulous, awesome uh, Eddie Hill, who's uh, coming uh, to us from Portland. Um, good morning, sir. Good morning. Hey. Um, I'm going to tell you guys real quick uh, about Eddie. Um, Eddie's actually pretty amazing. Um, Eddie is a community and, and neighborhood scale urban planner, designer, uh, community uh, food systems advocate. He currently serves as the director of Black Food Sovereignty Coalition Outreach Coordinator at Oregon State's uh, University's Hemp Equity Innovation Program. Um, he is direct and very sincere. Uh, we're going to have a great conversation with Eddie. Uh, and, and very focused on advancing environmental and social justice uh, through food systems and economic development in vulnerable and un undercapitalized communities. Uh, he started as a small farm organic farmer in Olympia, out in Washington. Um, and he has worked on getting people of color to be involved and collaborate in King County communities, uh, putting prevention to work, Healthy Foods Here project, served as a delegate for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation Food and Fitness funded uh, by King County Food and Fitness Initiative, uh, participant in the Delridge Healthy Corners Store Project. We have a Healthy Corner Store Project here as well. Um, started two farmer training programs leveraging city-owned land to advance economic opportunities for African immigrant and refugee populations in the Northwest while working for Tilt Alliance. He also worked as a program manager for Will Allen's Growing Power in Milwaukee and Chicago, served as city planner for Portland's Bureau of Transportation, been the ED for Groundwork Portland, led community outreach at the Rebuilding Center, and he lived through becoming an adjunct professor at Antioch University, Seattle, and National University of Natural Medicine in Portland. Um, he's also a member of the American Planning Association, the Seattle Civic Innovators Group, the National Association of Black Veterans, He's presented and facilitated workshops on food, environmental justice, community building, food system planning, environmental education for uh, University of Washington Green Law Group, Seattle University Education Department, Green Fest Seattle, American Institute of Architectures Bridge Chicago Program, Seattle Housing Authority, uh, OMSI Eco District Summit 26 and 17, and the African American, uh, African -American Leadership Program. And Eddie studied at California State University Hayward, Art Institute of Seattle, University of Washington College of Built Environment, and holds completions of training in parenting and husbandry as well. Those are the important parts. So I am really glad to introduce you to all of our friends here in Central Texas. Uh, in Central Texas, this is a uh, our new friend Eddie Benoit Hill. So good morning, everyone. Hey, good morning, so. Joe. So you are you are here on the second day of our our, our our conference, and yesterday everybody we had hours and hours of uh, uh, a lot of amazing talks on on a variety of things around resilience and um, and access. We've done so much here in Central Texas, and 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 uh, everybody I told um, Eddie's heard a lot about what you guys have been doing um, here and some of our, our friends around the country who are participating. I even gave uh, Eddie a little bit of primer on, on Austin, what happened in uh, 1928 uh, here. Um, and one of the reasons I asked Eddie to join us today uh, was because um, they've advanced uh, programs and a language in Portland that is, you know, in, in my observations that is way past uh, uh, advocacy and language that we have here in Central Texas. And they've gotten a critical mass and momentum out, out West 
that is that allows them to really engage each other and their governmental structures uh, to really uh, get the things, the kind of things that they that we talk about, that we're still talking about getting. How do we uh, have programs to to reclaim land and and use that land for sustainability, self sustainability, uh, to be able to grow um, produce, support our farmers. Uh, use our, our the, the grown product within our own communities. And that's some of the stuff that those guys are doing out there today. And Eddie's been going around the U.S. and working with others and talking about it and actually doing. And so um, the title of this, this conversation is about establishing long-term sustainability, but doing it through uh, an extended crisis. And what are those keys to action? So let me just read the paragraph real quick and I'll stop talking and we'll get to, get to the conversation here. Uh, although the pandemic is a crisis event, and most evident in our food systems, many communities have been in a crisis state with regard to food for a long time. There are layers to this extended challenge, a need to establish long-term organizational uh, sustainability, a need for a mix of roles and responsibilities as food systems advocates, professionals, academics, and creators, a need to use language as a mean of decolonizing and restructuring operations and models in order to engage our institutions um, and including including in that language and, and sharing that language uh, amongst our BIPOC communities and including our veterans incarcerated and our unhoused uh, neighbors. Uh, what is this shared language about what food needs to be, who needs to be at that reset table, and what are some keys to actions to get to a critical mass and momentum within a community to understand and advocate for its own food needs uh, very strongly? So that's a lot. Yeah. Right. That's a lot. So let's unpack some of that. So you know, the, you know, the basic question is how do you, how do you gain that? How did you guys? How do you gain that momentum? Right. Um, let's just talk about some of what are the roles. Some of the roles are needed to gain some of that momentum, Eddie. What what you know? What did you guys do? Who did you guys have? What were some of those pieces? Good morning, Joy. Um, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know, really, I just jumped out. Right? No, that's great. That's what's up. Good morning, Austin. What's up? Uh, good morning, Central Texas. Um, I, yeah, let's get into that. So, uh, that is a lot. There's a lot of there's a lot uh, there's a lot of elements, of course, to that question, and the everything you just asked, I just forgot. No, um, the, the the process of of um, I guess you know yeah. Let's roll back. Let's let, let's let, let's let, let's 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 call the point. Hold on, just a sec. So, can you? Can you start with the first question again? Because there was, there was a like I don't want to un I don't want to unload too much first, because that was you know that was okay. So so the first part is is you want to start with what are some of the roles or how do you get critical mass and momentum? Yeah. Which part? So let's start with the let's start with the critical mass. So so. Um, a lot of the work, I guess, for, for folks that know, um, sort of a George Plimpton kind of kind of guy, and have or my mom really had me. I remember George Plimpton, the movie, and then reading a Life article, Time article, news article when I was a kid about George Plimpton, and he would he was a journalist who would go um, write about stories by becoming the article or, or, or a participant in in the action of the of the article so if he like he played for the I think the Indianapolis Colts or something or the or some football team for like one game he kicked the ball or or got knocked down or something and you know but he lived the experience of training for for farming so uh, I mean for uh, for playing football and he did it for a bunch of other things soldier went to Vietnam you know wrote books about it but this experiential, um, this having the experience and and um, 
building critical mass means having people have the experience or setting up conditions and situations where the people that you are both attempting to work with as well as set a demonstration or an example of what you're trying to innovate or change or restore or heal or trans or, or, or transform or, or modify or evolve any of those terms or sustain uh, or be resilient with any of those systems require that people have their hands or touch them or, or ha and if you've been removed from that touch if you've never touched uh, a mason's trowel if you never touched a seed and put it in a you know a 64 uh, cup tray to put in a greenhouse if you've never like raised a child or had a, a baby there's just experiential things that that have you um change your whole life you're like oh my gosh yes right everything my mama said was right but that's after like you had the baby right <laughs> or that's after you didn't go to college and try to get a job or that that's after you you know like you tried to become a rap star and and it just didn't work you know so and it like you know i can't rap so no i cannot break dance so i, I knew that early in life <laughs> so i tried something else mm -hmm. So this this critical mass building this critical mass requires that people have the experience and then like a movement or a momentum right anything so with food there's 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 a, a a layering of of challenges and barriers that just aren't about race or ethnicity or or circumstance there's that's part of it there's it's asymmetrical as a person of color but also as a look at the appalachian hillbillies like at look at or white folks who are still, you know, in Central Texas, like Oregon, has Mississippi-style public health issues, and in the most, one of the most abundantly rich, least populated states in the union. We have four, just hitting four million people in the whole state. There's four million people on the south side of Chicago, <laughs> so where I grew up. So, um, at least, so that 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 um, building critical mass in an environment that doesn't promote critical mass, that doesn't promote gathering or cooperatives, you know, like the Germans and the Dutch of Minnesota that have a very cooperative culture, you know, everybody goes, you're like, oh, the co-ops in Minnesota are incredible. Why? Because they have not only American experience or the United States experience, but as a culture, they're very cooperative, you know, uh, in a hetero, you know, heterogeneous way, you know, like look at Scandinavian countries, um, mm -hmm. they, they operate well. But when they did the Oregon Trail and got out here, they couldn't reach critical mass with that dis dispensation. It, it didn't carry. So cooperatives in the community sense aren't a thing in, in Oregon. They are like Tillamook Corporation is a is a cooperative. There's right. large mega dairy cooperatives here, but you you wouldn't the community idea of of, of community around food, around small farmer cooperatives, that mostly is centered around the farmer's market, which has a monetary output. And that we know who dominates that. I don't know who dominates that in Central Texas, but I know who dominates it here. And it's not people of color, it's not indigenous people, Latinx people, black, brown, Asian. It, or the Hmong here do flowers. There's a lot of Hmong farmers because it was a program that was invested. So we can, building, Critical mass requires investment as well. It requires experience. It requires people to invest in it. It requires multitude of, of, of elements that need to be coordinated. And that takes time. And one of those things, and I'll, I'll stop for a minute to see, you know, to, to reset ourselves. One of those things that helped precipitate and drive a, a shift was COVID. There's, there's, you have to have circumstances you have to have people trained and ready to do it you have to have enough of a team that's ready to respond and then you have to have a situation that makes it you know so like covid started and that started it and then we'll get into the details then the you know the uh black lives matter uh, well actually the murders and killings of people in the street that 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 were black and brown folks and sparked re you know uh 
re-engagement with community policing and, and so those are specific catalysts yeah oh yeah most definitely yeah. that was a catalyst for funding and we'll talk yeah. about this a little more each covid was, was a catalyst for a shift in dollars and a collapse or a, a freezing of the existing food system which uh, also was one of those things so there's the food system isn't racist it just wants to own everything and do gmo and make fast food and blah blah blah. not just all the food system but the elements that work against like monsanto and and you know cisco and you know they're working on green green ideas but community small farmers community-based food systems is not you know is is uh is not supported by large corporate food manufacturers distributors processors co-packers etc so those realities are here as well we have one co-packer with with the, there's two co-packers in oregon they are on equal ends of the state and they've been stacked up forever and there's 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 no public infrastructure there's no community infrastructure for for all of that here and it didn't have and never had what's interesting about Oregon because of our history. We've never had a critical mass of African American or Native Americans, indigenous people, Latinx folks who were interested in agriculture at all. So not only that, it's not like Alabama or Mississippi or, you know, Saffon is down, you know, yeah. uh, Soul Fire and even North Carolina. It's a lot black family farm trust, you know, uh, black family land, land trust. I mean, those things can move fast because there's 800 black folks in the neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. within 50 miles of you here, there's eight, you yeah. know? And so that, that dynamic uh, has also- Oh, just tell folks real quick who's Soul Fire and the-, in the Oh land. yeah, yeah, real quick. Uh, Soul Fire Farm, uh, the Penniman, the, the Penniman, uh, Leah Penniman and, and her crew up in uh, upstate New York is a, a BIPOC black and indigenous centered uh, healing, land healing, restorative justice, food justice organization that has shifted and grown into a land-based uh, organization that, that has just established itself as a land trust. For the yep. 10 years, it went through a process, really deep community healing process, a lot of workshops, national stuff, like what Will Allen used to do with more spirit and more women and more people of color in, in ownership, which was great, mm -hmm. right? The business model and uh and have and wrote a book so they created funding sources you know based on kind of will allen's you know growing power was great in that looking at the corporate community intersection will was good mm -hmm. with stimulating that conversation uh you know unfortunately couldn't carry it they didn't carry into translating to the organization and they you know went bankrupt what was that in proper bankruptcy in 15 i think yeah 2015. yeah but he's growing cbd now and him so like yeah. whatever yeah. <laughs> I love okay, you. Sorry, sorry, guys. I had to keep I had to keep Eddie on track. So okay, so those are the examples. I mean, did right, that, right. but just we'll come back to you were saying, uh, um, in Oregon. So we didn't have uh, large groups of 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 communities that had um, that were already there, and you didn't have a large African American community necessarily in Oregon. So you didn't no. have groups of people or investment time, but you did have these catalysts. And so you were telling that story. So thank you. So the the the, the historical lack of, of uh, or the lack of engagement in land, and we don't, you know, if you want to hear, we hear it later about the history of Oregon and Washington. Um, we don't have to get too deep in it, but it's deep. Uh, but the lack of ability to own land until 1929 here for African Americans, and the the non traditional. Uh, kind of practices of what's been going on up here in the Northwest, folks, you know, three seasons when you could do four seasons that the, the opportunities, this is like 2007 with the corner store project. And, you know, for part of my work in that kind of plimpton nest thing is being in the rooms and being watching what was happening as people built critical mass and how critical mass was built. So I watched the, um, the um, early mural programs with youth in inner cities, the uh, working in group homes and doing art, using artist therapy, uh, the corners, you know, the school gardens was mm -hmm. a project, you know, early 2000s in Oakland that started to grow and move up and, and green for all. And it was, you know, solar panels and Van Jones. And then the, 
you know, Will had been doing his thing. So this critical mass of, of people interested in the bringing nature to, to urban space. So expanding people's understanding, different cities, people going back home and sharing information, building a network. Slowly, we we collectively, this is Riddall in, 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 um, in Cleveland. This is the, the uh, you know, Projects Emanuel in Chicago with the aquaponics systems. Mm -hmm. There's folks down in Texas, Atlanta, talking to each other and also taking that that advocacy and finding other people. So knowing that food systems, just like the food systems wheel, right? Each one of those, you have production, so you got to build farmers and you have to create farmer training programs. You have processing and 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 uh, manufacturing or value added you know, product. You know that if you put lettuce in a bag and you put a label on it, then just like brother did down, in, who started farm to school down in, in the panhandle okay, mm -hmm. yes you know uh put a, and then you, you have a school contract once you talk to a school district and you can deliver that regularly in a bag shredded ready for preparation then you can get a county contract and then you can get a doc contract and then you get your duns number and you get a federal contract for blah 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 and you start to build your staff and you start to train mm -hmm. people if you don't have the people like in oregon i've had to train people and set up not just me it's not i don't when i state me i oftentimes mean like 30 other people that mm -hmm. i work with that that are part of the pieces to make food systems work for 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 black and brown people like it works for for white folks and the dominant population and how it works for asian communities a lot of asian communities if you look the grocery stores system, their fresh food system. They are, there's Asian markets, there's Asian trucks that bring, or you know, information driven by Asian folks with, with Asian language, Korean, you know, whether it's South Korean or or Taiwanese or or Cantonese or you know Japanese, Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Those markets have sources. They, no, very few people have studied this in the last decade. It openly is they have a chain, in, which I appreciate of farmers. Just distribution systems, warehouses, and like a Wajamaya grocery store chain here in the Pacific Northwest. Those vegetables are always there. They're always fresh. And there's a lot of locally grown stuff. And I'm like, whoa, no, you know, like, wow, who's not, who's studying this system? Who's asking questions? But it's a very insulated system. But, but you're talking about creating a full chain of ownership. You have to. So that you can own it, that it doesn't break down. That, you know, the Asian story, you know, I was here in Oregon during COVID and the, 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 you go on the shelves there and there was a there was a steady chain Ad Mark Cisco a whole bunch of other people were stuttering Charlie's or you know organically grown uh, company here folks were like oh snap where are we sourcing and I, mm -hmm. I, I would go over there yeah you know can we come back just real quick to the you you made a statement about being in the rooms and I presume you meant rooms in Oregon, and we we're talking about getting momentum before we go to the economics. You were talking about being in the room. So what was in that room? Of, what was that momentum that that changed something in Oregon or or in Portland that people suddenly had a voice that that government and others listened to? What what was there? What was that? Um. I think for 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 for, for, for Portland, uh, I mean, yeah, okay. So, so having having more folks, like I tried to do this ten years ago, in 2010, literally, it was the year of urban agriculture in Seattle, and here in 2020 was the year of COVID, and applying similar uh, strategies. And what was different was we had run two farm conferences, uh, back to the root. We worked, we part, started partnering. Okay. So this was when I came to Portland, I left Seattle. I was, I was upset in 2013 and people weren't listening. The city mm -hmm. of Seattle was not listening to food systems work. They were mm -hmm. you know, getting shut down. All the programs that I helped create there, things slowed, you know, 2015 things were closed. People were like, what happened? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the folks we spread cast in the wind. So, and I think that was an opportunity in that we, we expanded our network thinking that it was a, it, it was a, not a fail, but like, we'll try again later. 
Mm -hmm. Conditions weren't right. People weren't willing to fund. The city didn't invest. The city council mm -hmm. still questioning it. They had, they took the food policy council and moved it to a an academic research mm -hmm. zone, which took it out of community, which took it out of the ability to access it because you had to have a PhD to be in, you know, like a data gathering GIS, like they were trying, you know, uh, Urban Land Institute and folks jumped on the APA, American Planning. You know, food became a food planning thing. And once that happens, you know, then it's out of community's hands. Once it becomes an MIT certificate on the weekend, then, you know, for food cert certified planner, you're, you're, it's off to the races. So um, as we were trying to fight against that and keep, keep those things in place, equity. So this whole conversation about equity and diversity and inclusion is what really helped make this change because 2010 to 2015, it was planning or equity roadmaps in the cities out here. Seattle had done a race and social justice planning. So the city and the county and the, the, the region, the populated areas, the, the, the bluer areas start in, of, of the Northwest started to look at, and the whole state look, is looking at bu building equity plans, diversity plans. How do we, how do we not, it's not affirmative action at all. How do we more actively engage in solving the problems that were created by establishing two, a two tiered living situation in the United States, for those mm -hmm. that have and those that don't, mostly those that are affluent and white. Even if you're poor and you have 150 acres of land, you're struggling to pay taxes on, you still have 150,000, I mean, 150 acres of land. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I can't cry about that. So that means the bad business, so you're not cooperative or you're just trying to have a ranch and you know, you, you have a lawn, you have a 50 acre lawn, it could be a farm. You're not monetizing, you know, you're not thinking smart, like any other regular person, right? Mm -hmm. So there's business like we were talking about. 50% of all businesses, regardless of what race you are, fail or you have to change the idea and, and you'll be successful, right? But initially that's just human statistics. So the building capacity and building momentum means you have to talk to folks. You know, you, you get city, not city council, like, hey, city, come solve my problem because it's not the city's problem to solve your problem. It's the city's, it's the city's a business to provide information to the public so that they can be best informed on how to request and 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 access the tools and resources that are held in that city to serve the public whether that be you know i've always been like that city tractor is mine right and it's yours and it's yours and it's yours that pile of gravel or or salt or chip bar that's ours right we pay mm -hmm. those people with our tax to do things and you know police everybody's paid the mayor you know right. all of this so the, the but the way that we have become disconnected with understanding how government works has failed us in the sense that at times we go talking to one office for the wrong thing like hey i'm yelling at the person over at at, at, at the department of transportation and the street lights are out and i'm like yo i hate you because my street lights are out and they're like that's over in like that's over in utilities i'm sorry you know and it's like you came to city council you've been working for five years to yell at me and you haven't realized that you, yeah i yeah. can, help, I can yeah. help you you ask me but you coming at me you know that the city provides information you're not going to solve our problems right they're, right, they're right. not going to do that they're trained to, to to answer questions so then we have to be, have and better so, questions and so when you saw that things were not working from 2010 to 2015, you left Seattle and you go to Portland, you changed, you you re, you guys realized that it had to go back to a community setting. It had to have, it had to have an equity conversation. Yes. It had to have a language shift and it had to be in the right space. Yes. In the right, in the right, in the right office, in the right offices. Um, yeah, yeah. Offices that, 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 that were actually, uh, that were actually working like public health. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you, you know, you, like you said, you have a, you know, a corner store, right. So knowing that public health and, and health disparities, this is disparities. like what money is right. So this is, this is the part. So, so the, 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 the people who are running the programs that deal directly with our communities, with, or with communities that, that have, 
uh, uh, in extremely disproportionate health disparities. Those communities have lots of money that come into them. You have to work. You have to find out where the money actually is, right? So it's it's transportation usually, and public health. So if you right of ways, right? So like in the city, alternative uses of right of way or um, the uh, the the uh, who to, go, you know, again, who to go to to have the conversations about the spaces you're looking to use. It's not necessarily the school district, it's facilities management mm -hmm. or real estate. It's not, you know, the port, the same thing. So you, you access had, actually, the place. Actually one, of our, actually, one of our talks yesterday um, that a group did was actually on some of the city and county's work around re land reclamation, um, particularly some of our um, uh, land that has been rezoned as uh, uh, flood zones, but it can be recaptured um, yeah. and used and, and for um, some of its highest use or best use, maybe agricultural lands, right? Um, right. But that's a potential type of areas like that. Most definitely. So, so being able to, knowing that, Right. So the urban planning thing. So at, while I'm doing this, I went back to urban planning when I was in my 40, early 40s and I found out that a lot of the community advocacy work and the arguments I've been having with people on the street, the city, the county, you know, developers, the sign board, you know, the permit board was up in a lot of protests. And I was noticing I'm like, something's not right, like not, not working with the movement. Right. So the food justice movement, environmental justice movement and the the equity movement were three things that have been moving for the last five years to a to a to a clarification, and that clarification, just like with triple bottom line, like mm -hmm. so, we, you know, moving from triple bottom line, and you you just saw it evolve. So it went to quadruple bottom line, and what it mm -hmm. quadruple bottom line coming out of Europe that adds culture and spirit. Mm -hmm. so now we we have a a a foundation four points on the ground spirit this is for the western mindset the western economic capitalist mindset has now added culture and spirit our traditional indigenous cultures had spirit and culture first and economic yeah, no, that breath is now it's fourth <laughs> sure. so here we are at this point this pivot point in 2020 interesting balance point interesting confluence of the restarting, attempted restart of a civil war that was never finished, you know, things like that. And th this gravity well of people knowing that action is the only thing that can take place. And this is where um, in Portland, having the having very few of us having to make an impact required, like in Chicago, thousand folks to show up for something in Chicago. In Portland, you only need 10, right? You mm -hmm. show up at a meeting, you show up at a consult, you have a document that says, hey, here's the five different parcels of land that the city owns, and we want to activate. We also knew that there were a lot of organizations, when we watched this, there were a lot of white-led organizations that, that moved into Black and Latinx communities to start farm and gardening programs as well during the mid-2000s to 2015. A lot of those programs have failed. They have not served the community well. They did not economically empower the community to own those types of companies, start greenhouse companies, nurseries, which are things that are all shutting down here in Portland. And so we also have an economic shift where there's an opportunity with an infusion of COVID response dollars, uh, equity dollars, compensation and white guilt money that came out of last year. We went from, we raised like $700,000 indirectly just from from the murders that happened last year. Because mm -hmm. we were in Portland and there were no other food-based organizations doing something. We also launched the farmer's market last year. We launched, we got a food delivery system started and uh, with an organization called um, uh, Equitable Giving Circle. And mm -hmm. they launched into their own program so we've been helping you know we use the confluence of all of those different things you know like a market trends person right like you're in the mm -hmm. food you know you're looking at this stuff 
So not everybody is, but a team of people, right? This is the, 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 the cooperative work in a space that is libertarian and very like, mm, I love you, but it's over there. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, be over there and I love you. Yeah. So that, that bringing that together, knowing that, and I couldn't have planned this. I just continued to prepare myself and study what was happening. Yeah. You know, have conversations with people like you. Yeah. Hold on one second. I want to make sure that folks, we got seven minutes. I want to make sure folks put your questions in to make sure that Eddie, because you guys know Eddie can talk. Um, make sure, <laughs> make yeah. sure Eddie, uh, you got questions for Eddie directly. Uh, I'm going to let him talk about just some of the things that their organization have, have, have done uh, just for mm-hmm. ideas for here that they've gotten off the ground. Um, and then uh, in the meantime, uh, Elizabeth's asking, um, can you just talk a little bit more? She, uh, she's interested in reading about the history of ag in the, in the Pacific Northwest that you're talking about. Uh, can you recommend anything? And yes. just so we don't lose it, just go ahead and tell people now how to reach you just so we don't lose it at the end. Most definitely. So um, Black Food Sovereignty Coalition, um, and uh, this is the other part, you know, like like buy your brands, you know, like create a movement by just putting up a website. I, I really just used my daughter's millennial techniques and she's been helping me, my 25 year old. So uh, www.blackfoodnw.org. So Black Food, North, the NW is Northwest. Um, and or black farm bureau.com but the uh, yeah black food nw.org is the fastest way um and it, it's uh edward at black food nw.org and uh feel free to i'm on tw- the black food Sovereignty coalition is on twitter Black Food Northwest, and we're also at Black Futures Farm. That's another one of our projects. Can you just tell them, just give a list of just Ooh, what yeah. programs and what do y'all talk to the city about right now? So, um, so yeah, that's the other thing. It's, uh, 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 we, we've worked really hard not to do work with the city. Uh, we, uh, okay, I'll, I'll buy that too. Yeah, no, yeah, you know, and we it not like like not against the city or I'm tired of the city, but I I was city planner. I can't go that fast, that slow. I can't, it, the, the city speed doesn't work with the, especially now, as we've seen, the government didn't, wasn't ready, you know, all that kind of stuff. So sure. now that we know that it's just like tactical urbanism, now we have enough skill sets in the room to create our own solution. And it's government agencies will get it when you start doing it. So we've been looking at companies and working with community-based organizations and finding the folks that haven't been getting served and haven't been connected and we're finding better luck with that and then the city sees it and then and then like now they're throwing money they're like oh can you do a survey for us about transportation planning and and farming and food and i'm like yeah we can you know thanks and you know so that's become like a steady stream where Sure. Now they're asking you to do you. You have the information. You have the connection. They're asking you to help do program management work. Right. Exactly. Which is a different contract scale, which is mm-hmm. not $50 an hour community work or $25 an hour you know, gift cards. It's $150 an hour consulting that feed mm-hmm. my organization because I'm a nonprofit director. But I'm a freaking professional that you need to yep. pay just like you pay anybody other city to solve your problems. I'm going to solve yep. your food systems issue because. Yep problem Mm -hmm. and that's that requires investment like utilities and roads well make sure let's make sure you answer elizabeth's question all right elizabeth got some we got some books or or what can she read oregon state um oregon state university on their website they have a page look up uh leticia uh uh carson or the carson ranch and, and just Google Oregon State University Carson Ranch, and th- that will open up. There's no specific. There's some. There's not a lot of history here that has been. We're the first folks. Like we're establishing all the things that Oregon. You know. So look at their website. Walida Emeresha, Professor Emeresha, I M A R I S H A, Walida. Uh, Dr. Walida, uh, she has a thing about why aren't there more black people in Oregon and the history of Oregon and the, the, the steep in racism. This is the last bastion of the Confederacy. So it's uh, really interesting history background for the place. Cool. 
Um, if you guys have questions, ready, go ahead and toss them in and we will get those as, uh, answered. Um, a couple of other quick questions. Let me just check my time here. I got a couple more minutes. Um, um, I hope this was helpful. Yeah, um, let's talk about just real quick. We'll talk about economics real quick. Yes. Um, what do we want to talk about economics? Um, real quick. So the the uh, activation of programs, the, mm -hmm. the looking for money, uh, mm -hmm. the partnering, you know, like partnerships have been key for economic development, ca capital mm -hmm. stacking. Around, right? sustain, around sustainability, right? Around, most definitely, right? Mm -hmm. So you like leaning on one set of grants, you know, diversify your idea about grant making, just like people diversify their ideas about their stock portfolio or 401. Yep. Little bits of here start like well, like from Will Allen. You know, I still use the same principle. It's like farmers can't just sell lettuce. You got to sell compost and honey and a book and video <laughs> and, you know, and have cooking classes with some which you you know some you got to have things right. You can't just be this whole like static monocrop kind of. That's why all these people are leaving farming. Ah, it's too yeah. hard. No, it's one not. Of the, one of the huge aspects of this whole conversation is that we have all these new relationships, innovative relationships, and that we, you know, that government nonprofits um, and entrepreneurs and our corporates had to have new relationships in order to do what what has happened uh, over 2020 to make to 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 feed those to sustain each other to sustain sustain ourselves to not see each other in competition or to see each other as moving into each other's spaces somehow mm -hmm. or, thing, or things of that nature. I'm, I am sure that folks when the Cook's Nook started are, are supportive of others in, in, in feeding our neighbors. They looked at us with, you know, with a lot of side eye and we had to say, we're not here to, to, to jump into whatever it is that, that, that you do. That's not what, that's not right. what we do. Um, but that these these relationships and new relationships are healthy and necessary, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Most definitely, and, um, and, and they need to be encouraged. And hopefully, folks are, are are walking away with that, you know. Real quick, the, the 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 one of the things that I kind of pass on with that is is go to a cookie, you know, go to the cookie section at the grocery store. There's like five or six different types of chocolate chip cookie, like just that cookie, and they're all making money. They're all on the shelf. And they're all being purchased, and and they're sharing that space in the cookie space, right? So it's like it's like the ag thing. It's it's we have to we have to we have to save ourselves. There's an opportunity for a certain market to develop that is much more economically stable for us. Yeah, yeah, sir. I'm going to thank you. Our time, we are we are done. You know, you and I could talk all day about these issues, but we can't. I just have to thank you because I know it's a little bit early for you. You're the best. Thanks a million. You guys, he's already told you where to find him. Uh, Eddie Hill's fantastic. I hope you get to hang around with us and you guys know where to find him. There's a lot of stuff today. I am going to yield the floor to my wonderful friend, Colonel Kim Olson, who's gonna be moderating the next thing and talk about actually our school districts and the amazing Herculean at uh, Atlas, Atlassian? Atlassian job that they've had to do this year in our communities. Um, that's it for us. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Thanks, Eddie. Ciao, everyone. <laughs>